our interviewing for today, Dr. Sajid Chaudhary. He is actually a very recent Purdue grad. He is currently an assistant professor in the Department of Electrical and Electronic Engineering at the Bangladesh University of Engineering and Technology. Without further ado, let's hear him talk. Hello, everybody. Um, welcome back for this week's uh, NSAC uh, interview series. Uh, this Today, we are going to be interviewing uh, Sajid Chaudhary who is currently an assistant professor at BUET, or the Bangladeshi University of Engineering and Technology. He's also a senior member of IEEE, and he holds the record for the smallest color hologram at the time it was produced. And as far as we know, still the smallest full color hologram ever made. So Sajid, to get started, how small was the hologram? So, um, so small as in the thickness uh, scale. So this was uh, made with epitaxially grown uh, silver films. So it was a uh, 30 nanometers thick at the time it was produced. So it was, uh, I think, I believe it still is the smallest uh, plasmonic uh, color hologram. And in the lateral dimensions? Um, N not in the lateral dimensions. Uh, so like in the, uh, I mean, uh, thickness, uh, Part. Okay, so but laterally, how big is it? So if you were to look at it, laterally, um, I mean, I actually tried to make it larger. So I was uh, using a focus iron beam uh, milling at that time. So it was uh, mm -hmm. around, um, I believe, uh, fifty micron uh, on each uh, dimension. So and then you can uh, stamp it and then uh, make it larger. Okay, so. So if, if you look at it, you would see multiple colors in different planes. Is that correct? Yeah. OK, so that's uh, it's very cool. So uh, and I'm sure that that has all kinds of applications to things like VR, AR, uh, and then the kind of the future of these micro uh, holograms and optics, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. So now that we know kind of what you're super well known for, uh, I guess it would be great to go through your like history and life story. So where did you, where were you born? So I was uh, born in Dhaka, which is the capital city of Bangladesh. So. Mm -hmm. And most so, of my life I was uh, actually here. I went for school, uh, my high school, college and uh, masters here. So if you, if you were to look out the window mm -hmm. of your house in Dhaka where you grew up, what would you see? that, uh, you know, what, what would you describe it as? Um, actually, where I uh, grew up, uh, which was in the Dhaka University uh, residential area, my mom was a professor there, she retired. So that's mm -hmm. actually quite nice because I we had a huge uh, like garden and a backyard, like, uh, I mean, mango trees and those kinds of things. But I mean, this is not uh, typically of Dhaka, which is like a very populated uh, city. Right. Uh, so typically, if you like look at the window, you'd probably see another building or like uh, it's, uh, I mean, very congested. So if I give you an idea of how congested it is, so I mean, mm -hmm. imagine like Tokyo and uh, which is also already a crowded city and mm -hmm. Dhaka, we have the same amount of population, but right. Dhaka is like 20 times smaller than Tokyo in terms of like a land area. Oh my goodness, it is so crowded. <laughs> Yeah. So, yeah, commuting must be a ton of fun to get around Dhaka. Well, uh, I mean, it wasn't, uh, I mean, uh, that uh, previously, but uh, now I think government is trying to make a lot of flyovers and ring roads to make it uh, decent. Right. And we're hopefully by the end of this year, we would get a, a monorail uh, running. So that would make lives better for the well, uh, citizens. Well, that's that's great to hear that they're, they're attacking. So how... Like if you want to get from one side of Dhaka to the other, okay, what's the fastest way to do that? Mm, I mean, right now, uh, depends on uh, like the, uh, uh, probably if you want to travel fastest, you would uh, avoid the uh, peak uh, hour traffic. So and then like you can use the highways and then like go from one part to another. Okay. So, so I see. So it's the fastest is definitely still car, yeah. but just make sure you don't hit the rush hour traffic. Yeah. So I'm guessing that's in the morning at like 8 a.m. and in the evening at like 4 or 5 p.m. Yeah. Or is it different? 
Uh, no, so, it's uh, similar. But I mean, after 5 p.m., it's like a rush hour throughout like 10 p.m. or something. So people would either go to like shopping centers or like traffic. Yeah, that's kind of oh, thing. wow. So it's 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 like uh, it's like L.A., but <laughs> but even more crowded. So what's yeah. the what's the temperature like right now? Right now it's uh, comfortable, so um, mm -hmm. I mean it's I believe uh, 70 Fahrenheit, uh, around 20 oh, degrees wow. Celsius. So it's it's like perfect weather mm. there. So all right, so you you grew up in in Dhaka, and now if uh, if you had to, you mentioned your mother was a professor, um, and so how did you find this like did this inspire you to want to become a scientific researcher or how did you decide kind of that you wanted to be go into science right i mean um that's uh, one interesting story so when i was uh, growing up i was more curious and i would always either bug my sister with uh, like small questions and like try to understand why things were working so mm -hmm. and then like uh, to probably shut me up my parents they bought me some encyclopedias and books so i was reading those uh, like science seemed really the place to go to get like big answers of the universe and like how stuff worked so that okay. really uh, like piqued my interest i see so then i i guess you go to high school uh what what is high school like in Bangladesh? Like uh, mm. you know, if you had to describe a typical day, right? Because yeah, sure. Uh, so it typically uh, from uh, we call it like a secondary school certificate, which goes from grade one through grade ten. So most people they go to one school at that time. So then for like a typical American uh, like junior or senior year of high school, we call it uh, like college in Bangladesh and. Mm -hmm. uh, at the end of it, it's like secondary school certificate. So for okay. my high school, uh, actually there is like a really prestigious college in Dhaka, which is called the Notre Dame College. So which is okay. uh, also like run by the same uh, Holy Cross missionaries who run the uh, Notre Dame University in Indiana. So I, okay. I mean, that's the most uh, prestigious uh, like higher secondary school. So I went there for my uh, like uh, high school studies. Okay, so, so how does the like so what what is it what is a typical day like? Because in the U.S., for example, uh, teachers stay in the same classroom and the students move around, or is it uh, different there? Uh, no, it's uh, for uh, our high school. It was uh, like a fixed uh, class for us, and then the teachers would uh, move around. It was okay. uh, fairly big, so the, uh, we had the science portion and like commerce portion. So it was about like 2,500 uh, students in each uh, year. So we have first year and second year. So it would be a chaos to let students move around. Yeah. Okay. So <laughs> that makes a lot more sense. Yeah. So, so uh, that's uh, so it must have been pretty intense to to study at, at such a prestigious uh, high school slash college. Yeah, it, it was, uh, I mean, uh, quite uh, intense and like you would get homeworks and uh, everything. So typically they would uh, try to follow the U.S. Uh, model of education since it's mm -hmm. a missionary run school. So they would right. try to give us like small homeworks or class tests uh, throughout the year. So, OK, so uh, and this also this is different from a more standard Bangladeshi kind of high school. Mm, yeah, uh, so I mean. Typically, if, uh, I mean, as I have heard, I uh, I mean, most of my friends actually went through the same high school uh, there. Right. But it's uh, probably not as intense as the uh, like Notre Dame College uh, over other schools. Right. Right. OK, so you go to high school and then you take, I assume, some kind of entrance exam to get into Buett. Yeah. So yeah. that's also like a very competitive. So most uh, students in Bangladesh, like I mean, engineering is the first choice for students to go and for like if they would probably um, go to Buet first and then if they cannot get entrance into it, they would uh, go to different uh, universities. 
uh, okay. I guess uh, like uh, also like at um, that time there was no like good private universities as well. So like it was right. really, really competitive uh, to go into. Okay. Typically, like after the higher secondary uh, exam, uh, people would uh, study for like three or four months before the entrance exam of Buet. So they would wow. uh, prepare and then you have to go there and give the exam. So so would you say that the entrance exam for Buet was harder or easier than your, uh, what is it, the qualifying exam that you took <laughs> in PhD? Mm. No, probably PhD qualifying was. Uh, mm, I mean, uh, neither was very hard to be honest. Oh. Uh, so, uh, like for Buet, uh, I think I did one very silly mistake, like doing a like sim simple pendulum uh, math. So, I mean yeah. that I felt really stupid when I realized that okay, I like messed up that like really simple uh, like right. problem. So, I mean, then I was like down for like one week and then I heard that, OK, I got chance there, so which was right. good. Oh, that's, that's for, good to hear that you made it through. Probably for, uh, I mean, qual qualifying exam, uh, I heard so much about it, but um, for our case, the exam was really simple. So typically you have like a four hour exam, right? Uh, yeah, it's four hours long. So yeah. uh, somehow I, in my mind, I was thinking it's a three hour exam. So I like <laughs> wrote everything in like two hour, 45 <laughs> minutes and then, okay, no, I made, made a mistake. So never mind. So then like yeah, <laughs> it was finished. So, okay. Yeah, because uh, yeah, the qualify exam is at Purdue is interesting because at least it used to be very variable, right? Because mm. I think one year, right, the, like nobody passed in an area and then mm. other years everybody passes so it's, yeah it's pretty... especially for fields and optics i think that's like the tiktok level yeah yeah that one i think they they i think they've changed it now i think the qualifying mm. exam is moving yeah they, they abolished the like formal qualifying exam right so you have to just yeah, take yeah. the uh, like a major area courses that's right, right which so. is uh, which is uh, which is nice actually that mm. it's it's changed because I, I think a lot of people spent a lot of time studying uh, you know, like basically this like summer before people spend time studying for the exams. Yeah. So, so you you're you're a PhD student at at Buet, uh, and um, so what what is it like being an undergrad there? Right? Are there any traditions or any crazy things that people do or? Mm -hmm. Buet, I mean, there was this really weird uh, tradition that where like students would be, uh, I mean, we ha give a lot of emphasis on the final exam. So like there used yeah. to be a tradition of like students not wanting to sit for the final exam and then they wanted preparatory leave uh, for like um, extra one or two weeks. So they tried to like uh, shift the exam at a later date. But yeah. uh, I mean, that was um, when I was an undergrad, but uh, fortunately now it is, it's like the opposite. So students are more uh, like, they know that if they like reschedule the exams, eventually they're the ones who would be losing. So, I mean, right. I, I as a professor, I'm still getting paid by the Bangladesh government for them. So now, I mean, they're more like concerns and then they don't uh, like uh, shift their exams. OK, so, okay. so but uh, like because so does Buet, Buet have any like rival universities, you know, like, for example, uh, MIT and Harvard are always making fun of each other even though they're both you know, great so universities. For engineering, uh, I mean, Buet uh, was, uh, is uh, like still unparalleled. So, I mean, since uh, we have another big university, Dhaka University right next to the yeah. door. So there's yeah. like uh, this uh, like silly rivalry between the two campus where like students would post memes and other things about one another. So that's okay. uh, one thing. But at Dhaka University, they have like a more comprehensive system. So like they have arts program and law, law medical program, those things. So like really we cannot uh, like compete with them. So basically what you're saying is if I see somebody who's an artist that lists Buet on their CV, I should be very, very suspicious. Mm. So did mm. you... Uh, also like me. Pintu is from Tech University, so Pintu, if you're watching this, uh, like I'm sorry for mentioning this. <laughs> so the uh, so 
with uh, with the university, uh, do you live on? Did you live uh, in the dorms there, or do they have dorms, or how does it? How does the university system work there? Well, uh, they have uh, dorms, and uh, but there is not enough number of seats. So, and since uh, Buet is a public university, so it's very subsidized by the government. So right. typically, the university encourages whoever has a house in uh, Dhaka to like a, a commute. University gives a bus service, and then uh, they would commute. Uh, okay. For me, like my mom was a professor of Dhaka University, so my house it was actually uh, about a point uh, six miles uh, away from my department so i would typically <laughs> just walk from my house it's okay so now that you mentioned this sort of rivalry uh, how does your mother feel about you becoming a professor of buet as a professor at dhaka university <laughs> Oh, it's uh, probably, I mean, she was uh, definitely proud of that. But I mean, right. the rivalry, it doesn't stem to the faculty members or anything. It's more right, right. towards the like freshman students or something like that. Um, I'm, I'm just surprised your, your mother hasn't rubbed it in just a little bit. <laughs> but um, so uh, and then what's like uh, if you had to pick your most memorable, like, you know, incident or, or story from your time as an undergrad, like what would you pick? Mm, I mean, uh, there are uh, lots of uh, different uh, memories. So uh, probably I really enjoyed uh, working on different projects, uh, like some of the like laboratory classes they would give us mm -hmm. uh, like small projects. So there was one time we had to do in our control system lab. So we had to make a object sorter. So that for that, uh, like we were uh, working on a deadline. So. I probably worked uh, like whole night and then like the thing was finally working. So a okay. uh, couple, couple of times uh, there was a wiring problem and I think our microcontroller just like started smoking and then we burned like five or six chips and then like when it <laughs> worked, it was like fantastic. Okay, so that's, uh, yeah, because I, I don't know if you've ever seen that movie, The Three Idiots, have you seen it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I, maybe I don't know how how accurate that movie is to that kind of life, but uh, yeah, there's that scene where he builds, you know, this super project inverter thingy, and then you know he's running around oh, yeah. with it. So I'm I'm imagining that that's that's <laughs> kind of what you look like <laughs> with that project. Um, yeah. So so you you wrap up your undergrad and then you immediately go to MS. So what's the difference between an MS and a, a BS like at, at BUIT? Like, is there any change or is it similar, like just an extension of BS? No, 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 it's uh, not an extension. So I had to give another admission test to get okay. admitted into the MS program. And mm -hmm. then uh, like you have to do like six additional courses and then do a thesis. So it's a completely different uh, degree. Okay. So it's it's a pretty it's pretty intense actually to get a to get a, a master's degree from uh, Buet. So you what did you do your MS thesis on? Uh, I was uh, working on uh, like a, a mid, uh, I mean patch antennas at the time. So I okay. uh, tried to incorporate uh, fractals into a uh, patch antenna structure. So, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, at that time, uh, my supervisor was uh, sick. So, I mean, he didn't push me. Unfortunately, I also didn't uh, publish uh, my results other than my right. thesis at that time. But uh, I was uh, working on this novel hexaflake uh, patch fractal structure. So okay. when I came to uh, Purdue, like Vlad liked that idea uh, a lot because like he was also working on percolated fractal structures. So right. like, it was uh, directly related. I was about to ask. Okay, so how did you how did you meet Vlad? How did that happen? How did you come to Purdue? And I think yeah, it's becoming clear already. <laughs> so how did you how did you decide to go to Purdue? Right? Why not? Uh, you know, all the other universities. Uh, so when I was applying, uh, I actually had a faculty position uh, right when I graduated, but mm -hmm. I had to work uh, wait uh, a couple of years before there is a permanent post available. And I could get a, a like study leave to come to US. So uh, okay. I mean, it took about three and a half years before I could go. 
So when I was applying, I really uh, was looking in uh, like small college towns and uh, exclusively applied on like uh, public schools uh, that uh, were not situated in a large area. So I apply, I mean, based on my applications, I applied to Georgia Tech, Purdue, uh, Ohio State and those things. Yeah. So most of them, uh, they got uh, me funding. So I was kind of uh, deciding between Ohio State and uh, Purdue. So right. Ohio State had a really good uh, radiation laboratory at the time. Professor uh, Volakis uh, asked me to go there. But yeah. uh, at, for some reason, uh, Professor Volakis uh, worked, wanted me to work on just uh, numerical simulations and not on experiments. So mm -hmm. at that time also like Purdue gave me an offer for a teaching assistantship. So okay. I it then decided to come to Purdue since uh, it had a like a better fabrication facility. And yeah. I also had like a friend from undergrad who was uh, working here. So okay. uh, I mean, it was a better choice at that moment. Okay, so uh, and then I assume that your since your MS was uh, on plasmonics and nanopatch antennas and things like that, that that immediately uh, drew you to Vlad or? It was actually not uh, plasmonics uh, related. It was more like microwave uh, patch antenna. Okay. Well, it, it was uh, quite interesting. So I worked on this frequency selective surface. So the in microwave, so the yeah. same thing was like meta called meta surface in optics. So it was uh, like kind <laughs> of related, but right. uh, uh, first, I wanted to work on uh, like uh, Professor Kevin Webb, so I was under the impression that I would be working on like a microwave related uh, structures because I wanted to go mm -hmm. back to Bangladesh and then able to do the experiments. But right. uh, Professor Webb also wanted me to work on uh, photonic structures and then right. like uh, I decided since uh, photonics, uh, I mean, Vlad and Sasha was really like they had fantastic uh, projects going on at that time. So then right. I approached uh, Sasha and asked her to, I mean, uh, let her uh, uh, work me with her uh, for one semester. And then mm -hmm. uh, like after that semester, Sasha offered me a research assistantship. Okay, so that's that's how the, the sausage is made there. Yeah. That's very interesting. Actually, I think I think that happens a lot because actually, um, when I came to Purdue, I also went straight to Kevin Webb's group mm -hmm. as one of the the groups I was thinking about joining, and then ultimately I also <laughs> ended up going yeah. to to Vlad's group. So because they work in and very cl before close. Before that, uh, Amir Shaltout, uh, who's now in Stanford, so he also yeah. worked in Kevin Webb's group for one half years before he switched to Vlad's group. So yeah, happened. so. Yeah, it, I mean, it makes sense because they're very, they're very closely related uh, mm. research areas. But yeah. I think Professor Webb, he tends to focus more on numerical simulation yeah. uh, and and more into like speckle theory and things like that than than antenna like nanophotonics. Mm -hmm. So it's very interesting, like how how interrelated everything is. So you you're at Purdue, uh, and uh, I see that you became the president of NSAC. Mm -hmm. uh, so, what years were you the president of NSAC? That would be our first uh, question, actually. Okay, so I ask. became a president in uh, 2017 uh, of mm -hmm. uh, NSAC. Before that, in 2016, I was the vice president of NSAC when Abhik Dutta was the president. Okay, so moving up in power levels. Yeah, I, I, I don't know how many people know this, but I was actually uh, Sajid's hospitality chair. My job was yeah. to bring the cookies <laughs> to, the, to the coffee hour. So, what was your what, what is like the the achievement you're most proud of uh, as president of NSEC? So, for NSEC, uh, I mean, uh, before uh, a week uh, took over, um, yeah. Justice uh, Nurgaife, he was the president of NSEC. So, he is not right now in Vanderbilt uh, University. So. Right. Uh, after that, uh, he did a couple of uh, great conferences, and uh, but the core activities of NSAC, I felt like they needed some revamping. So mm -hmm. one of the like major activities previously was the NSAC coffee hour. So it was yeah. kind of like dying out, and I felt really bad. Like Justice had to go to the office and like drag people there to like listen to the talks. So I thought like maybe.
be like what is like a I mean one thing what the hungry grad students would uh, need if like we want to bring them to the talks. So then right. I thought that if we could give like good treats and cookies and food, maybe like people would be interested to just come from the cookies and then like they would first feel bad to stay for the talk. And then if we can bring interesting talks, people would be eventually encouraged to join the talks. Right, so right. then like I wrote this grant and uh, like, uh, thank you, Sam, like you were the hospitality chair. So uh, taking care of the um, uh, buying the food and uh, bringing it there. So I think we were like doing a lot of experiments, uh, bringing in right. like, uh, what was those uh, like uh, cig cigarette like? Uh, yeah, rolls? the pir pirulinos. Pirulino, yeah. yeah. I yeah, mean, they don't those were them like, a, 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 thanks to Sam, those were like an instant hit. So like when uh, people, uh, uh, my theory worked. So like before that, we were having about like a t a five to 10 uh, par participants in the coffee hour talks. So after the snacks came, it, uh, the participants uh, number went up to like 30 to 40 per coffee hour. So that was wow. uh, like one uh, big uh, achievement uh, I'm really proud of. Uh, another one was, uh, I don't know, probably but students don't remember this. They, we used to not have a good microwave oven in the kitchen. Right. So we had uh, written this grant, like uh, Purdue graduate student government is was giving out a grant where mm -hmm. they would fund some equipment. So I just thought, OK, like since a Black Friday was coming, I want to buy a TV and a microwave uh, from yeah. Thanksgiving's uh, sale. So yeah. then uh, like we wrote the grant and uh, we got five hundred dollars. Then I convinced Sam to like be the man <laughs> going to Walmart and <laughs> buy the TV for NSAC. Yeah. So uh, is it still there like in the? Yeah, the uh, TV is still there. So OK, so yeah. if, if everyone uh, doesn't know, like Sam was the one who went there to buy the TV and then he decided that the Google deal was too good. So Sam bought a TV so for himself. TV. <laughs> so it was great. Then, <laughs> I actually had to go to Walmart and then buy another TV and then we brought it to Burke and uh, Professor Shakuri helped us uh, install it in there. So that was all good. And then with the remaining money, we bought the Raspberry Pi, which uh, serves at the display board, and then uh, went to like Best Buy to buy the microwave oven. So that was uh, another thing. Yep, so. it's all that stuff is still there. Okay. Still, still says uh, property of <laughs> NSAC on it. Yeah. So, so that's how we have all those microwaves. Yeah. So uh, I saw that you were also the president of the Bangladeshi Student Association. Mm -hmm. So, like, what what is it that you did during that time that, like, is your presidency of Bangladeshi Student Association you're most proud of? For, Other uh, than our performance, you know, yeah. the performance of the Mother Language Day. For uh, Bangladesh, uh, I mean, that was like a, a bad year for me, like in terms of extracurricular work. So I had to kind of uh, divide my time between NSAC and the Bangladesh Students Association because I also became the president of it in 2017. So right. for I don't that, know how you dealt with that many things at the same time. Yeah. That was so a lot. for Bangladesh Students Association, if you go to their website, I think we had the highest amount number of events that year uh, during my presidency. So it was like uh, about uh, one and a half times uh, more than the previous year, something like that. Okay. So it was uh, fantastic at that time. So I'm uh, particularly proud of that uh, the association was more of a social club for the members. Right. I wanted to bring in a international flavor to it. And uh, like since we are there to study, I wanted to bring academic element to it. So yeah. for that, I actually, I mean, Tridip uh, helped me spearhead this project called the BDSS Symposium Series. So we okay. got the PGSG Symposium grant for it and then we were inviting the PhD students from different areas of uh, Bangladesh community to give mm -hmm. a symposium talk there. So that right. became also really successful since we had, thanks to the PGSG, we had the uh, lunch uh, going on there. So, but right. uh, I mean, we also like for the first time collaborated with the Pardu uh, Women uh, Graduate Students Association to mm -hmm. make a women's uh, symposium on the I International Women's Day. So we okay. invited 
after a, a female a PhD students from a talk uh, there, mm. uh, like uh, Bangladeshi female students. So those are some of the like highlights of the events. So of course, there were like the usual events, like the International Mother Language Day, where uh, actually Sam and I performed there. So those were like good memories as well. Yeah, definitely was a very nice time. Yeah. So you you're president of these two organizations, and then like I guess more of a like research style questions. What what project did you work on that you're most proud of? Uh, yeah, we'll start with that one. Which which ones are you most proud of and why? I mean, uh, for the hologram project, it was, uh, I mean, academic wise, uh, it was uh, one of the uh, projects that I was really proud of because, uh, mm -hmm. I mean, we got the publication, which was a little late because of the fab problems and everything. But right. uh, we also got a patent out of the color hologram idea. So that. Okay. Uh, we got that going and I mean based on the work I it was like my first uh, project in uh, Purdue so where we, I could uh, like go through the all the aspects of like uh, simulations and fabrication so it was like okay. a really uh, my favorite project to work on okay so you like this sort of multi-dimensional like project where you do simulation, fabrication, characterization. Yeah, yeah. So that's like your kind of that's your jam, mm -hmm. more or less. So okay, so that that project went pretty nicely. So which project was the worst? Like which one failed the most? Or you're like, oh my goodness, I wish I never <laughs> touched that. You know, which one of those, like which one, if you had to pick one? It doesn't have to be a total disaster, but like which one are you like look at and you're like, oh, we shouldn't have done that. I think, uh, I mean, there were like, I mean, obviously a number of uh, different failures. So uh, some, sometimes uh, we were probably little over optimistic uh, that this would work. Like right. uh, we were uh, trying to uh, get some roll to roll uh, manufactured uh, meta surface uh, that project. I was really hoping that it would catch on and like we would be able to right. mass uh, manufacture meta surface. But right. uh, uh, at the end, uh, the materials uh, that we were getting, like it wasn't really compatible in terms of fab and uh, that mm. project, we couldn't uh, go uh, very far. But I, uh, I mean, uh, recently, Sarah uh, Choudhury, she told me that she is probably picking up the project and trying to get some results. So probably, I mean, uh, good luck to her and uh, probably she could be more successful than me. OK, so that's. Yeah, so basically it's just that's a, that's a pretty ambitious project since yeah. I think mass production of meta surfaces is still not been done actually or or it's like very limited size like not roll to roll that I don't know if anybody has managed that yet. So, mm. yeah, good luck to Sarah. Mm. Um, so, you know, you speak about Sarah starting a project. So, I, I want to ask what do you see as mistakes that like young and PhD students are making? Like if you had to give a piece of advice to PhD students about how to be a successful student, right? What now that you've been through it and you're a professor, what would you what would you tell them? Uh, well, uh, I mean, this is uh, I mean, an interesting question. There are uh, like certain yeah, I mean, uh, it would uh, obviously depend on uh, your particular uh, PI or uh, any particular student's PI. But uh, I mean, I my uh, idea is like PhD is a unique experience for each of the students. So uh, it's uh, more important to, uh, I mean, probably enjoy uh, what you're doing and like uh, set uh, clear uh, expectations or what you want to get through the degree and then uh, what you want to achieve out of it. So probably, I mean, there is a lot of talk uh, it, amongst the PhD students where like they have unrealistic expectations and at the end uh, they don't uh, meet those expectations. So I think it mm. would be better to just uh, like set the expectations straight and then uh, like go to the PhD. And um, mm -hmm. I mean there is also like uh, I mean uh, Rohit Chandrasekhar he, he told me this yeah. like there are uh, like a number of uh, people who probably PhD is not the best course of action for them so Right. Probably they would be more successful in going to a, 
and a job or like uh, working on a certain project. So probably like uh, doing some sort of soul searching before uh, coming to graduate school, that would be uh, one uh, good way of avoiding those kind of situations. Right, I see. So basically you're saying that once you're in PhD, you know, just make sure you don't expect that you're going to leave as like some sort of demigod yeah. that knows everything on earth. Um, that, so like, what would you say a reasonable expectation for a PhD student would be like what like if you were starting like what would your expectation be you know as a PhD it's, student? Uh, more like a I mean you're there to gain experience and mm -hmm. you're specifically there to learn how to do research so that's yeah. the ultimate goal of the PhD so if you okay. get uh, like good uh, papers out of it that's fine but uh, don't get discouraged if you don't so like right. uh, towards the and I mean, if you get the skills, uh, you would become uh, successful, hopefully, in the near future. Whether okay. that can be in PhD or uh, like during postdoc or even when you're, you're a professor. Right, right. Okay. So now, you know, speaking of moving on to the next stage, like what, whenever you submitted your CV, right, to mm -hmm. Guet, right, to hire you, um, what would you say like the most critical components of your CV were? Like, you know, what do you feel like people really noticed? Uh, for Buet, its uh, hiring process is actually a bit uh, different. So mm -hmm. it's more uh, like focused on the academic uh, credentials and CGPA of a student. So that's the uh, they focus on that uh, primarily for uh, hiring okay. lecturers and then going to. But for uh, I mean in general for academia, I think uh, like the reality is uh, you have to have I mean. Uh, good uh, publications and you have to uh, demonstrate that you are able to independently do research and uh, even uh, like bring in your own funding and be self-sustainable. Okay. So, and so sometimes it's, it's also like luck. Uh, so depending like if your uh, field uh, that you're currently working on uh, towards the end when you graduate, if that field is really like popular, probably you would uh, have a better chance of getting yeah. into a faculty position. Yeah, that's what, what my undergraduate academic advisor told me. He's like, it's almost a miracle that anyone gets a job because mm. you have to have the right skills. You have to, the department has to want you, like want that particular skill set at that particular time. And yeah. if any one of these things is not present, it's like not going to happen. So it's, mm. It's pretty uh, amazing, actually, what uh, what <laughs> what there is. So speaking of like, so now you've got the job, like what skills that you learned at Purdue at Burke do you think have benefited you the most now as a as a professor? Uh, I think the soft skills were uh, more important uh, for a mm -hmm. faculty position, uh, particularly uh, like writing grants or uh, I mean, thanks to Vlad and Sasha, I had some experience on that or particularly yeah. writing paper, uh, oral communication. Those were really helpful. Okay. And I mean, there is also like as a PhD student, since you're uh, like trained on becoming a learner and a researcher, so it's uh, easier for you to like switch fields or like read uh, papers and understand if you right. want to go into a different field. So. Those are mm -hmm. the, I mean, skills I take away from uh, Purdue. Regarding okay. the fab experiment, experience, there is not a, like a huge fabrication facility at the moment in my university. So we are still writing a grant and then trying mm -hmm. to make it happen. So probably so, when that happens, uh, my experience would be uh, like the lab experience would be more useful here. But it, it, I guess as you underline, right, you're having to write grants talk to people, convince people, you know, that, that they need to build the facilities. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, the soft skills are are kind of underrated, I guess, in, in terms of how important they are. So the other thing is that now you're kind of managing uh, multiple projects, right? Yeah. With your professorship, with students. So how do you, how do you manage all these different things, right? How do you keep all these like balls in the air? Right, without letting them any, any of them fall. What strategy you use to plan out your day or to you know keep track of your tasks or, or whatever? Sometimes, I mean, if it's a deadline related problem and uh, like it's 
gives, uh, I mean, my university also gives a lot of related responsibilities which need probably uh, addressing right away. So those are like urgent things. Typically, I just uh, like try to have a to do list and then like check off uh, the tasks uh, based on priority and like uh, mm -hmm. based on importance. OK, so yeah, just you, so you're a, a list person, just puts everything into the list and then tries to, to get it done before it lights on fire. Yeah. That's a that's a good good technique. Um, all right, so I guess what is like if you had to look thirty years from now, right? What would you mm. want your legacy as as a professor to be? Like, what 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 is it that you would like in your career to achieve? Mm, and I why? Mean, uh, well, uh, uh, being a professor, particularly a university professor, you are you are actually responsible for uh, like undergrad students and then mm -hmm. you're supposed to mentor them uh, educate them and like choose them a, a proper career path. So I right. would uh, probably like 30 years down the line, I would probably be uh, like to be remembered as a, I mean, a professor who could uh, change people's uh, lives for the better mm -hmm. and uh, like uh, be remembered by my students for that. So like as a, a successful mentor. So okay, that's uh, my uh, like goal uh, right now. Well, that's excellent. Yeah, the the world the world needs more good mentors and and professors like that because yeah, you're right. You know, a good professor can completely change your life. Actually, you just completely change it. So I guess looping back just a little bit because mm -hmm. we're we're almost out of time. I, I guess we're out of time. But uh, what is your favorite memory? from your time at Berk? Mm, um, well, uh, problem is like well, memory works in funny ways. So I remember like all the times <laughs> when like I forgot to turn off the like gate valve in the label and then the system cracked out those things. I think uh, right. like uh, the best part of uh, like working in Berk, I can tell that. So it was uh, how I could work with multiple uh, in a true global environment. So I had the opportunity mm -hmm. to work with people from Russia, Ukraine, uh, Kazakhstan, uh, Romania, like all of Eastern Bloc, and then like uh, Nigeria, uh, Western Europe, Switzerland. Uh, I met people from Colombia and other places like right. even uh, staying in Bangladesh. I uh, had more interaction with Indian people or Pakistani people when I went to US uh, and uh, worked in uh, Berk. So the global experience was the best part, I, I think. And even in NSEC, when I was in the executive committee, so we had yeah. like some people from all of the uh, con uh, all of the world uh, who were working there. And then uh, yeah. I could uh, volunteer with them and then learn how they think or approach a problem. So I think that was the best part of uh, working in Burke or uh, like staying in Peru. OK, yeah, it's it is definitely wonderful. That aspect is definitely wonderful. I think now the yeah, the NSAC committee is now a combination of well, whenever I was there it was yeah, Bangladeshi and American and I guess Romanian. So we actually had a, a and also I think Argentinian. So we actually had a huge variety and that's and it carries on this year because now it's a combination between uh, Chinese, Argentinian and uh, and uh, Indian. So mm -hmm. there's yeah, it's amazing. Actually, you're right. It's one of those things that you sort of lose track of uh, over time as you work in Burke that you realize it's very rich uh, community. So mm -hmm. to close out uh, the, the, the talk, what is one piece of advice, right, that, you know, you you would give to everybody listening right as, as phd students or as early stage uh, professionals like what what advice uh, do you have uh, that you you think would be valuable i think uh, like uh, being a phd students we sometimes ignore the soft skill development and uh, focus more on the like research and uh, success, uh, getting good results and things. Right. It's also very important to get the communication skills and the soft skills uh, for your uh, career. So I can okay. uh, quote uh, Professor uh, Vladimir Shalaev on this, uh, my uh, previous, uh, I mean, Sam's uh, advisor and my previous mentor. 
sector. So he said that it, and when you're like you will grow up, probably 20% of your income would depend on your directly hard on research skills or technical skills, and 80% would depend on your communication skills. So okay. when you're a student, probably you should uh, work on improving the uh, soft skills as well and network uh, communicate and uh, being involved with uh, an organization like NSAC where you have the opportunity to volunteer. It also gives you the right tools and uh, right opportunities to uh, develop these soft skills. So you should uh, probably get involved in NSAC and work on that. Yeah, that I 100% agree. As two presidents of NSAC, you should volunteer. You will learn so much more about practical soft skills than you would think from being part of that organization. All right, well, thank you so much, Sajit, for all of your time and uh, for this wonderful talk. So we wish you the best and we wish your students the best. Thank you so much, Sam. Bye, everyone. <laughs>